My name's Judith Still, and I'm an Emeritus Professor of French and Critical Theory at the University of Nottingham and a Fellow of the British Academy. And today I'm going to talk about an American farmer, J. Hector St. John de Crèvecoeur, and what is an American? So Crèvecoeur was born in France in 1735 and died there in 1813, but lived most of his life in North America. He first traveled across the Atlantic as a very young man to fight for the French against the British in Canada, which was a really unhappy experience for him. Of course, uh, the French lost, but also he found warfare tra traumatic, um, particularly um, the brutal colonial wars where native peoples were used as weapons and as alibis for exceptionally cruel practices, certainly scalping, murder of civilians, including children, and maybe cannibalism. Anyway, at the end of the war, rather than returning to France, as so many soldiers did, uh, Kevka traveled south, working as a surveyor, um, but then he settled very happily as a farmer, taking British identity, because of course at that time, um, America was a British colony. And at the same time, he was writing copious notes and draft manuscripts about this new land and its peoples. Now, I'd describe uh, Kevka as a philosophe. Um, this doesn't easily translate into philosopher. Um, it sums up a kind of enlightenment thinker who challenges the uh, easy prejudices, received ideas, or indeed ideology. Now, um, unfortunately for Kevka, his more or less idyllic existence in New York State was to be shattered by the American War of Independence and he fled to France. Um, en route, he paused in London and found a publisher for what then became his canonical work, Letters from an American Farmer. But once in France, he began kind of rewriting all this stuff and producing major tomes in French, which greatly expand on his material. Um, he did return to America um, to join in the inauguration of the new United States as French consul. So the most famous chapter of Kevka's most famous work is entitled, What is an American? And still today, this is often anthologized for the uh, delectation of American students. And his work can be, and is, used to tell a very positive story about the land of the free, hospitable refuge to the dispossessed of Europe, a glorious melting pot where a man who works hard can provide for his family and be treated with respect, whatever his origins and whatever his religious beliefs or lack of belief. However, it will come as no surprise to you that such a narrative is too cozy. Um, no surprise in our period today where the legacy of the enslavement of so many in the so-called new world still impacts on large number of people's lives. Now I want to argue that the monolingual reception of Kevka, the determined focus on his writing in English, has made it easier to ignore what a very complex and uh, conflicted picture he paints. So as a philosoph, highly critical of the beliefs underpinning pre-revolutionary feudal France, or indeed Ireland, where English landlords fed cattle while the Irish starved. Hevka then desperately wants to believe that America can be a remedy, an opportunity for a fresh start, egalitarian, with land to provide for anyone who needs it. Yet, his French works, which are largely ignored by English language scholars, emphasize three major problems. Genocide of indigenous peoples, enslavement of Africans, and environmental degradation. Now murder or brutalization of indigenous peoples tends to be written off or screened in the myth of the American in three interrelated ways. So the first, is denial of the very existence of the first inhabitants of the Americas. The explicit or implicit claim that settlers came to an empty land. The second rhetorical strategy 
is the bestialization of the people who were often named savages, or sauvage in French, a related rhetorical trick as animals don't own land. But equally, if these people could be shown to be ignorant, violent, and bloodthirsty, even cannibals, then killing them is a natural response of self-preservation, like exterminating wolves, which of course the settlers did as well. <laughs> the third trick, if you will, is the development of the narrative of the relatively good Indian, who was well treated by Europeans, who traded with them as hunters and bought their land in fair treaties, rather than uh, stealing their land with threats of annihilation. So any settlers who behave differently, who weren't uh, such very fair and peaceful individuals, were bad apples. Yet, within a century, the population of native peoples had been reduced by 90%. And those still alive, who didn't assimilate, were confined to reserved areas, systematically starved of food supplies, and encouraged, of course, to be dependent on alcohol prime trade good. Clever, um, as a quasi-American, is also consumed by the question of the possession of American land. Yet he does allow a different perspective, which is what makes him so interesting. And he was adopted himself by the Oneida nation. Um, he introduces his French readers to individuals and groups of Native Americans, and he enlightens us as regards the ideology and practices of settlers as they impact with dire consequences on indigenous peoples. Now the ideology underpinning enslavement uses a number of related arguments. Enslavement, like genocide, is denied in that slaves were not deemed to be human beings, but things, property. And I should say that this view prevailed not only in the new USA, but in Britain even as it might seem to end with the abolition of slavery and the recognition of common humanity, yet compensations paid to West Indian slave owners for their loss of property, not paid to those who'd been enslaved because their freedom had been taken from them along with the fruits of their labor. And we British citizens were still paying that blood money until recently. Now, the strategy of um, bestialization was also deployed and still echoes today, presenting Africans and particularly enslaved Africans as akin to animals, brutal beasts who needed to be tamed or passive livestock. Then again, we have the myth of good slavery, kind masters and grateful slaves, rather like children. Um, and then, criticism is only to be directed at the bad apples, the very cruel southerners. So Kavka again here is a conflicted figure. He is anxious about the shortage of labor in the new world. However, as an abolitionist, he not only strategically points to the viciousness of plantation slavery, but he also makes, I think even more importantly, the absolute ethical argument of the philosophe that owning another human being is never legitimate in any context. So finally, in terms of um, environmental degradation, just for lack of time, I'll just note that Kevko was recording as early as the 18th century, how overhunting was leading to the wiping out of numerous species. Kevko was torn between his enthusiasm for farming, for improving the land, and his recognition of the dangers of the very activity he was praising, particularly deforestation, draining of swamps, or over-cultivation of land so that its productivity wanes. And we can contrast this, of course, to the much more sustainable methods of, of native peoples. Um, in conclusion, so I'd just like to note that, that within the groups identified um, in, in this short talk, there are many splits and fissures which also impact, of course, on the apparent goal of equality, notably, of course, sex. I hope you noticed my he-man language, which deliberately mimics that of the period. At the same time, the divides of class and ethnicity or, or country of origin 
are more disturbing than many contemporary or later accounts acknowledge. So the colonizers are of course not simply one group. There's a distinction between say, poor Irish migrants or wealthy English ones for the sake of the argument. So already in the 18th century, the French English American Oneida Kavka points up the original sins of colonization and then of the founding of the United States by settler colonists, which impact not only on Americans today, but have global ramifications that have disturbed and still disturb lives across the world. <laughs> 